All right, the title of uh, today's sermon is Conflict Resolution. I want to talk about today. If somebody does wrong to you, uh, what is the right way to go about resolving it? So uh, we have some steps in the Bible we saw there in uh, um, Matthew 18. And, you know, sometimes people think that, uh, and, I, and I joke about this a bit, that sometimes people think being a Christian is uh, a bit like being like Ned Flanders, you remember in The Simpsons, where you know, he was a bit of a pushover and uh, every time somebody did him wrong, he just had to like take it. And, uh, and people think that that's the Christian thing to do, to just be this doormat where you, know, you can't stand up for yourself. If somebody does you wrong, you can't seek restitution. You can never confront anyone. You can't uh, do that sort of stuff. But of, of course, that's not the case. Now, you need wisdom on whether or not or how you go about uh, conflict resolution. And that's really the tricky part. So even though the Bible gives us escalation steps and things like that, that doesn't mean every single conflict needs to be, you know, resolved. You've got to ask yourself some questions. I mean, so there's a right way of going about resolving it. Uh, does it need to be resolved? You know, so it's, this is not a black and white area. You need to ask yourself, I mean, is it an issue that needs to get resolved? Is it, is it worth causing a fuss over? You know, have you ever heard the saying, you've got to pick your battles wisely. You can't make every, you know, you can't fight every battle. Not every hill is a hill to die on. I mean, it's the same issue when it comes to conflict between people as well. Um, is, is, does it, does, is it worth causing a fuss over? You can ask yourself the question, you know, does it affect fellowship? You know, does it affect your service to God? Does it affect your reputation? You know, sometimes, you know, people might say something, you let it go, but you say, hey, it's affecting my reputation, you know, my, and my, my standing amongst the community or publicly, you know, I've got I to gotta deal with this. Um, you know, maybe financially, you might go, well, it's not worth fighting over, you know, um, others, it may, it may be worth it, depending on, you know, uh, what the value of the thing is. So it's the answer to all these questions, when it comes to, you know, when to resolve conflict, um, you know, that requires wisdom. You know, what is wisdom? Wisdom is, you know, it's the, it's the application of God's word, you know, based on several factors, based on knowledge, life experience, you know, understanding of maybe societal, cultural norms, understanding of human behavior as well. So, it's, uh, that's why when we talk about wisdom, it's, you know, the application of principles is, is the most difficult part, I think, of, of life, you know, Christianity. You know, you can know the Bible, you can know the steps. Applying it is always the most difficult application. And that's where all the gray areas appear, when to apply, how to apply it, you know, uh, who to apply it with, and, uh, you know, what are the steps to go about it. But we'll talk about a few of those things today, and hopefully that'll give you some thoughts, and we'll, at least we'll look at the Bible on uh, these sorts of topics. Now, the first area I want to talk about when it comes to conflict resolution is long-suffering and forbearance. Long-suffering and forbearance. So you, you may, in a conflict, you may just decide to forbear and suffer the wrong done against you. So this is what, obviously, <laughs> Ned Flanders in The Simpsons was famous for. But what I, what I want Christians to understand is that's not always the right solution. But that doesn't mean that that's always the wrong solution as well, right? There's both. So sometimes you may just want to let things go. You may just want to long suffer long with it and forbear, right? So let's just look at a few verses here on long suffering and forbearance. Ephesians 4, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, right? So I like that verse. You know, there's a, there's a way we're expected to work, walk as children of God, right? So God wants us to walk in a certain way. With all lowliness and meekness, you know, it's like humility. With long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. So you can see how they're sort of linked, where, you know, you suffer long with forbearing one another. What does it mean to long-suffering and forbearing? Well, you know, long-suffering is quite self-explanatory, right? Where it's where you suffer long. You allow things to happen for a long time. You know, that's sort of the word patience in the Bible is the same. When you're patient... It's not just waiting around, it's actually going through trials and tribulations, you know, suffering long, forbearing. Think about bearing, it's like carrying things. You're able to bear things for a long time. Forbearing one another in love. So you can see there that how's one way that we, are, we walk worthy with the vocation, we, with the accord, we have humility and we, you know, put up with one another. You know, that's probably not a, the best way to put it. And you know, the nicer way to put it is with long suffering and forbearing one another in love. But, you know, we might say it today, hey, it's, it's putting up with one another. You know, sometimes we'll, we'll clash. Sometimes you'll annoy one another. Sometimes you'll offend one another. But you, you suffer long. You put up with it. Endeavoring to keep. So you see, endeavoring, what's that? 
striving, striving to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You see, it doesn't just, just happen. You, know, you can say, hey, we've got communion here because we have fellowship in Jesus Christ. We have a similar beliefs. But that doesn't mean we don't have the flesh. Right? We all live in the flesh. The flesh still can clash with one another. That's where divisions and all this stuff comes from. So we have to strive to walk in the Spirit, strive to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Colossians 3 is like the parallel passage. So if you didn't know, uh, Ephesians and Colossians, they're sometimes referred to as twin epistles. It's a bit like Titus and Timothy. They're like the pastoral, they have the pastoral epistles. It's Timothy, 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus. But, you know, a lot of the things that are covered in 1st Timothy are covered in Titus. So, you know, they, they talk about these twin epistles. Sometimes there are twin passages as well. Another one I can think of is uh, Jude, and uh, I think it's 2nd Peter 2, where it's like they're very similar. They touch on very similar topics. But this one, these ones are written by the same person. You've got to use Paul to write Ephesians and Colossians. But when you read through these two, they read very similar. So it's like two letters to different churches, but touching on the same topics. And uh, you can see that that's what preaching is like, like too. Sometimes you might preach on the same topics and say things differently. And we get an idea here in Ephesians and Colossians. So anyways, read that. When you, when you read through Ephesians, you read through Colossians. Just take note of that. You'll see it's very similar. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. And we'll talk about forgiveness a bit later in the sermon. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. So how do, you, how do we have that unity, right? And the Spirit well, it requires love. And part of love is keeping the commandments, which is forbearing one another with long suffering. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. So this is, the, this is to obviously preachers and pastors and teachers. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, right? Because, you know, the time will come or they're They'll not endure sound doctrine. So it's telling us to suffer long. You know, we preach and we need to put up with it, right? So in the context of conflict resolution, sometimes you may just decide to forbear and suffer the wrong done against you. Look, here's uh, God being long-suffering. 2 Peter 3, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us with not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So you see how God, he puts up with us constantly sinning against him every day. The unbelievers here, he's waiting for them to come to repentance, right? To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's long-suffering, right? He, he allow, gives people a lot of time. I mean, you have a lot of time to decide whether you believe on Jesus Christ, right? In, in, you know, in terms of years, I mean, life is short compared to eternity, but in terms of years, you have, he's, he's very patient with people. To, in order to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, those who have not yet accepted Jesus as their Savior. So long-suffering is suffer long. Forbearance is like restraint, isn't it? It's putting up with people. Now, one thing we need to be aware of, be aware of, or beware of, is, and, and this is the problem, is if you think long-suffering or forbearance is the only avenue you have as a Christian, you need to be aware of bitterness, so this is why I joke about it with like this Ned Flanders example because you, <laughs> I don't know if you guys used to watch it when you were younger, but you, there was this episode where he finally cracked it and he cracked it at everyone. He got really upset. And that's what will happen to you if you're not careful. If you think the spiritual thing is just to bottle up the hurt, bottle up the offense, bottle up all the conflict and just think, oh, I just, you know, and, and people have a misunderstanding that they think that's forgiveness. Oh, I just forgive. I'm just such a forgiving person. I just let it go. I just let it go. I let, let it go. Yeah, until you become like Ned Flanders and you crack, right? So it's not always good to just not take the avenues of conflict resolution. But like I said, there's a, there's a, there's a bit of both. But look at uh, Hebrews 12. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So that's what we're striving to do, we're striving to have peace, striving to have unity. But that doesn't mean we just sweep everything under the rug and just bottle it all up. You know, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, look at this, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many 
be defiled. So that, it just reminds me, I know I'm using Ned Flanders as an example here, but it's like this. It's like if that root of bitterness springs up, you know, and troubles you, you can, you can end up defiling a lot of people if you, you know, allow that root of bitterness. So you have to be wary of bitterness, you know, so that's why it's not always good to just bottle things up and just, you know, take it on the chin and things like that. And we will uh, talk about those verses in a bit. So, long-suffering and forbearance. Now, this is something that the, you know, and this is something that the offended party decides to do. Right? So it's not that you wrong somebody and then you demand them to drop it. Right? Be forbearing, be long-suffering. You know? So this is something that the offended party is meant to decide to do. They, they decide, okay, am I going to make a fuss of this or not? You know, am I going to confront the person? Am I going to try and fix this problem? Is it causing me any issues? Or is it just something I should let go? But keep that in mind. You know, it's not something that the, the de- it's not demanded by the offender. You know, just drop it. Let it go. You know, sometimes, sometimes people wrong somebody and then the person tries to resolve it. They're like, oh, just let it go. What do mean? Why do we need to talk about it? It's not for them to decide. Whether to drop. They may want that, but that's not for them to decide that the person who's been wrong uh, should, should drop it or not. And again, you know, you don't want to keep the bitterness and be defiled like we see here in Hebrews 12. Um, okay, I've talked about it. All right, let's go on to the second point. So number one is you may just be long-suffering and may just forbear. But number two, let's say you want to seek a resolution, seeking a resolution. Now, you may choose to seek a resolution because you've judged that there is benefit to the confrontation, right? Either to clear the air, make, you know, try and fix it, seek forgiveness, those sort of things, right? So you may choose to seek a resolution. Now, conflict resolution is the responsibility of both parties. This is what some people don't know. You know, they think, well, if that person's done the wrong, then the ball's in their court to come and apologize. But that's not the case in the Bible. In the Bible, both have a responsibility to try and mend that relationship, right? To try and mend that relationship. So whether you have done the wrong to go and ask for forgiveness, or whether somebody has wronged you, you know, because may- maybe they don't even know that they've wronged you. Right? You may be bitter about it. So it, if there's a rift in any relationship, it's the responsibility of both to try and mend that. It's not only for the offended person to go, oh, well, they offended me. They should know. You know, they have to come to me. And likewise, you know, well, we would generally think it's usually the offender that is responsible to make up for it. Right? But look what it says here in Matthew 5. Matthew 5. This is talking about when we offer, we're trying to give something to God. Now, this could be a service, but here it's bringing a gift. It says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, right? Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. So this is, this is the scenario where the offender, right, is saying, hey, Somebody has something against me because I've done something wrong. Before I go and do all this stuff for God, I should go and make it right. You know, rather than, you know, trying to do these things for God, giving an offering to God, and yet, you know, I have wronged a brother and have not, you know, gone to seek forgiveness. So there's one scenario. One scenario is is your brother has ought against thee, right? Where you've done something wrong, go and make it right. And Matthew 18 is what we read this morning. Matthew 18, 15 says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee. So I don't know if you noticed this when we read Matthew 18 and we sort of read through these steps, but I point this out every time I address this topic. That notice here, these are the steps in order to resolve a conflict. But you can see the first step here is not that you've done the wrong, right? And then now you're, you know, going to seek forgiveness. This is the other way. It's when somebody does wrong to you. So you may think, well, if somebody's done wrong to me, they should be coming to me and trying to get it, make it right and apologize and things like this. But that's not the case in the Bible. In the Bible, it's like somebody has wronged you. And that's your responsibility to go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Obviously, if he's done the wrong or she's done the wrong, it's their responsibility to ask for forgiveness. But it's not necessarily only their responsibility to raise the issue. And like I said, why? Because they may not even know that you're offended. 
Right, so you know you're offended, you know you're upset at something, it's up to you to, to raise that issue with them. So what are the steps we see here? So my first point is, with these two passages, is that conflict resolution is the responsibility of both parties, right? If you're aware of the fault, right? Now here in Matthew 18, verse 15, we see the steps that should be taken. Not everyone follows these steps, even though they're outlined in the Bible. Matthew 18, 15, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him between his... Go and tell him his fault between thee and him... And look at this next word, this is the key word here. Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Now, I think a lot of fires, in terms of, uh, you, know, you know, gossip or arguments and conflict, a lot of this could be resolved if we just followed this verse, right? Go and tell him between thee, and this is like good, it's singular, you alone, and him alone. So if, if people just resolve their conflicts in private, you know, sometimes that, that you know, that, that, that uh, avoids a lot of conflict, right? Because one thing I didn't say at the beginning of this time, we're talking about conflict resolution. I told the kids this morning, hey, sometimes it's good to try and avoid the conflict at, at all. You know, that's, that's the best first step. The best first step is trying to avoid the conflict at all. And if you have charity and love towards one another, you won't have these conflicts, right? Uh, you know, like a, 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 what do they say? A, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And it's no different when it comes to conflict, right? So very first step, so step zero is here, let's have love for one another so we avoid this conflict. Uh, uh, at all, uh, as much as possible. But we live among sinners, so conflict is inevitable. But if we follow these steps, you know, it, it'll resolve them a lot better because sometimes when people have a problem with somebody else or there's a conflict, what's the first thing they do? Is they tell everyone but the person, right? They'll tell their friend, they'll call their mom, they'll call their aunt, you know, call their aunt, call their sister, they call their brother, they're uh, they with their mates out, oh, and then they tell everyone, oh, you know, this guy did to me. So they tell everybody except the person that's done the wrong. It's just the exact opposite of what the Bible's saying. The Bible's saying, no, look, if you have a problem with somebody, if there's a conflict, you go, go tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So you see, the idea of conflict resolution is not just to throw back hurtful words or make them know that you're upset. The idea of conflict res resolution is to resolve the issue. Right? So you can see here, the idea is that you're not going to them, just put them in their place, let them know, oh, you upset me, and I'm giving you a piece of my mind. You know? That's not the idea, because what? Because when you tell his fault between the enemy, look at the result. The result should be, thou hast gained thy brother. Right? So the idea is that you respect them enough, you love them enough to raise the issue in private, and you resolve it, you know, try and say you're sorry and whatnot, and resolve it. Step number two, verse 16. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Now, another thing that people misapply with this verse, you can see in this verse, the idea is now, if, if conversation one on one doesn't work, that you have a conversation in a group with a couple of witnesses, two or three witnesses. It could be just other people from church, it doesn't necessarily have to be me, it could be anyone. But you're trying to resolve it, you can have some mediation between as you can bounce back and forth and you can have some neutral parties say hey this is what we think or at least know what is said and people can give their case but some people apply this to say well you know I heard you know somebody's doing something you know I heard it from Andrew and I heard it from Alex but I don't but th then that confirms it for me ah you see the mouth of two or three witnesses it's confirmed that person's now done whatever they're accusing them of of course not, right? The idea here is the offender and the offendee, they're, they're present. With the, the, the witnesses, they're not witnesses of the, the event, they're just witnessing the con conversation. So they don't necessarily have to be necessarily witnesses of the event, but they're witnesses of what's being discussed, right? So you still need to discuss the issue and make sure that if there are, you know, witnesses of the actual issue, right? But they should be maybe part of this too, to say, well, I saw this. And then everyone can say, oh, is that what you said? And, you know, and, and, and uh, what's the word? Like cross-examine uh, cross, uh, these things. 
So this, this idea is not, oh, okay, well, I just heard it from this person, and I heard it from this person, therefore it's true. No, it is, hey, there is a conflict between two people, they can't resolve it between themselves alone, so let's get a few more people to discuss and talk about the issues, and you know, even the people that may be involved, bring them to say, hey, this is what happened, right? So that there are more witnesses to this conversation, but it doesn't need to be everyone at this point, right? And now verse 17, and if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and as a publican. Now, this idea here, I don't think this is, well, if he doesn't hear this group, then you just go and tell everyone, like, you know, in the church, like, tell Andrew, tell Natalie, tell, make sure everyone knows this. That's not what I think this is saying. When I think it says, tell it unto the church, I believe this is referring to escalate it to church leadership, right? So, there's an escalation process here. And you can see this in businesses, you see this in the court systems, it's just an escalation process. You try and deal with it, with them alone. You can't resolve it. You get a few more people involved. If you can't resolve it, then maybe it needs to be escalated to church leadership. This is not saying that then you just tell every, per, you know, this person visits church, oh, they need to know as well. You know, tell them, you know, this guy, you know, so it, things like that happen. It may not be like their first visit to church, but they may be a new, new believer or a new, <laughs> new member of the church. They don't need to know about all the dirt that's happening between everyone because you feel as though this is the right application of this verse. That's not the case, okay? So there is this due process, Right? And like I said, it's the it's a responsibility of both people. We see in Matthew five, hey, if if somebody has ought against you because you've done something wrong, you know you should be reflecting on that as you try and serve God. You know you're doing something for God, but you know you've wronged this person. And it's unresolved. You know you're meant to say, hey, look, I should make sure I deal with that first before I go and do something for God. Maybe uh, so. There's a due process. Now, why does this due process? exist, right, where it's together, you know, and then with people, because it may be found that, you know, the offended person's position is unreasonable, and therefore to proceed any further would be wrong. So that's why it's good that things go through the church first, to decide, hey, what is the right avenue? You know, because sometimes when, when we'll, and we'll look at that a bit later, where, you know, people go too quickly to the law, you know, the law is not always just. Sometimes it's very expensive, it might be unnecessary, it might be wrong to do in some instances. Um, now, because there is an escalation process, you can see that it's not always right. You can, you can see it's not always the case that you just let things go. Because if it was the Christian thing to always just let things go, sweep it under the rug, you know, take it on the chin, you know, whatever people say, if that was always the right thing to do, why does this process exist? Right, this process exists because if somebody does you wrong, there's a way to escalate if you choose to do it. But if you do choose to do it, then there's a right or wrong way to do it. Now, what if somebody's done you wrong, but they're not in your church? Well, you know, maybe you have to escalate in their church. But if they don't have a church that they go to, then obviously you can't go through these avenues. So you may have to, you know, you may ask, you get some counsel, how do I go about this? And you may then need to go through external avenues. So this is really talking about situations where the people involved are subject to some sort of church community so that that community can be used to judge that issue to see what uh, should be done. All right, let's go on to number three. So you may choose to suffer long, long suffering, forbear. If you seek resolution, we've got some steps in the Bible how to do it, who's responsible, as you can see, it's both parties to try and mend that relationship. Now let's talk about forgiveness, forgiveness. So let's say, you know, I'm trying to seek a resolution and, you know, if somebody's willing to admit they're wrong and for, uh, offer forgiveness. So how does forgiveness work? So forgiveness is making it as though the, it was, that the wrong was never committed. That's really what forgiveness is, right? Forgiveness is saying, look, it's like they, they didn't do it. Like God, when he forgives us, right? He forgives us and he's removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. Now, let's look at some passages to do with forgiveness. Matthew 18, we, we looked at this one with the parable of the unforgiving servant. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. Jesus saith unto him, 
I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Verse 23, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. We can see, like, in, in this parable, right, like, the, the, our sin is like an account, an account of debt that's racking up with God. And uh, this king is forgiving people of this debt. For his, but for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. This is what I want you to notice with forgiveness. That sometimes when we talked about long-suffering and we talked about forbearance, sometimes people misunderstand that that is forgiveness. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is not you being wronged and then just going, you know, don't bother with it, right? That's long-suffering. That's forbearance. And then we, you have the dangers that come with that, like we talked about at the beginning of the sermon. Now, what is forgiveness? That's not forgiveness. People are saying, oh, you know, you just got to forgive, just got to forgive, as though you just take it on the chin, right? Forgiveness is when somebody, there must be an admission and, and, and a requesting of forgiveness, right, in order for forgiveness to be given. Like, you can't give forgiveness if somebody's not asking for it, right? You can long suffer, you can forbear, but forgiveness is now the person who has done the wrong is now asking to be forgiven and then forgiveness can be given so we can see here in this parable that the the servant is requesting you know time from the lord right and i will pay thee all see then the lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt so he he was just asking oh just give me time to make it up to you and the lord had compassion he said hey well i'm just going to forgive you this debt right and you don't have to pay but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants. So the parable goes on to say, hey, well, God has done this to us. We should be forgiving also. The same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. You can see the debt is a lot less. Right? So this is also a lesson here in that we have committed such grievous sins against God. God has forgiven us. You know, we really shouldn't get so offended when people you know, do these things to us right? and be, be willing to forgive, which is so much less than what we did do to God, which owed him a hundred pence. So what was the difference, right? He, he, he had 10,000 talents. I mean, t you know, talent is a multiple of a pence, and then 10,000 of those. And here, this servant owed him 100 pence. Uh, what is this? Oh, wait, we don't see over it. Tell him, oh my God, yeah. There we go, verse 28. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him 100 pence. And he laid hand on, hands, hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, I will pay thee all. So it's the exact same scenario, isn't it? And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So there's some lessons there about forgiveness. And obviously Jesus is teaching in the Old Testament here. It's a New Testament passage, but he's under the Old Testament here. And that's why there's that work salvation tinge to it as well. Now, so my point here about forgiveness, and we can see here, my point is that forgiveness is when somebody asks you for forgiveness, right? So just doctrinally, forgiveness is not you just letting things go, right? That's long-suffering forbearance. Forgiveness is when people ask you for forgiveness. So forgiveness can only be given when it's asked. But what we see here in these passages and what Jesus is talking about is that if somebody does ask for forgiveness, Right? If they, if they, like the Bible says, if they repent, right, and they are sorry for what they've done against you, and they ask for forgiveness, then you are commanded to forgive them. Right? So, so you don't necessarily have to forbear. You can try and seek resolution. But if they ask for forgiveness, then you must forgive them. This is what is being commanded in the Bible. Luke 17, look, take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. 
if he repent, forgive him. If he trespass against thee seven times in a day and seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. So you see, the person might have done wrong to you, and you can decide whether or not to resolve it or not. But if he comes to you and says, hey, I've done wrong, I'm asking for your forgiveness. If you don't forgive him, now you're in the wrong, right? Now you're sinning against God because you are not giving him the forgiveness that he's asking for, right? And you say, like, yeah, but he just keeps doing wrong. He just keeps asking for forgiveness. Well, this is this scenario, right? This is the scenario. This is why, you know, uh, Peter said to Jesus, you know, should I forgive him till seven times? And he says, no, until 70 times seven. And it's not that you, he's saying that 490 times, but the 491st time, it's enough. That's it. Right, he's making the point that, you know, no, it's, you just keep forgiving. As long as he comes for forgiveness, even if it's in the same day. You know, if you trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent. Thou shalt forgive him. See, Luke 17. 1 John 1. So this works the same with God. You know, not only when it comes to, you know, we, we call upon the Lord to be saved. We don't get forgiveness of our sins unless we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see how God doesn't just give forgiveness to everyone, you know, whether they ask or not. So this is, works the same way with God, that when we ask God for forgiveness of our sins, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's when we receive forgiveness. And it's the same. Once we're saved and now we have a relationship with our Heavenly Father, you know, as children of God, we can ask for forgiveness for trespass as well and mend that relationship, right? So there's the forgiveness for salvation and then there's the forgiveness for mending that relationship too. First John 1, look, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. See, if we confess our sins, then we get that forgiveness and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Psalm 86 verse 5, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. Why is he ready to forgive? Because you need to come to him to ask for forgiveness, right? He doesn't just let it go, you know, without you coming and saying, look, once you've asked for forgiveness, but then God is obviously obeying his own commandment. So if you ask for forgiveness, he will forgive. And plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Right? So, you know, in some instances, you know, in some situations, an apology is sufficient. You know, ask for forgiveness. But in material matters, the church may judge that, you know, restitution should be paid. You know, so there, there are some instances where it may be right that, hey, you, you may have forgiveness, but there's still maybe something that needs to be resolved. So when we talk about forgiveness, it's like, it's, it's forgiving the wrong. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that financial things may not take place. Right? So it's the same. This is where Muslims go wrong. Now, Muslims will say, ah, oh, yeah, but God, can't God just forgive? Yeah, he might be able to forgive the wrong, but the punishment still needs to get paid. You know, that's why he can, God can forgive us because Jesus paid the fine. Right? But if Jesus didn't pay the fine, then you know, saying sorry is not enough. That's why when people say, well, when you say sorry, well, saying sorry doesn't get you off your punishment. It's like when a police pulls you over and you get a fine, you can't just say, I'm sorry. He's like, well, you, know, you should be sorry, but now you've got to deal with the fine. Right? Because you've got the law to deal with, even though the relationship might be mended. So, if, reconcil if reconciliation is not possible, then your only option is left to forbear and leave it to God if you're not able to get reconciliation. So, you know, in some instances, you don't have a choice whether to long suffer and forbear. And, you know, that may be a test on your faith as well, right? But we don't want to intentionally do it unnecessarily because if we do, then you might just be building up a root of bitterness, right? You don't want to be defiled and defile others. So... There are times when confronting people and holding them to account is a good thing, but it requires wisdom to know what battles to fight. Now, let's just address quickly some misunderstood verses, because you might be thinking there's, there's some common verses that people will think, oh, yeah, but doesn't the Bible say we can't go about things this way? One is in 1 Corinthians 6. So 1 Corinthians 6 is really talking about, uh, and, and, and the, 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 the popular verse that people kind of keep parroting is, um, suffer yourself to be defrauded. Say, hey, if you're wrong, that, and this is uh, this idea I'm, I'm talking about, that if people wrong you, then you shouldn't seek restitution. You, there's, no, there's never a reason to take somebody to court. Um, and really, you should just suffer yourself to be defrauded. Just be like Ned Flanders, basically. Um, which I don't, I don't agree with. 
And let's just look at 1 Corinthians 6. It says here, Dare any of you having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. So now when you read this passage and you think about this, this escalation process of alone, a few, peop- you know, a few people, church, then you may decide what to do next, right? This is this issue here that people were just going to suing their brothers, like this lit- litigation, going to the courts before dealing with it, you know, trying to settle it privately, trying to settle it amongst a few people, trying to, you know, uh, you know, settle it, you know, amongst some people within the church. And then before deciding, look, you know, we can't get a resolution, we may need to engage, you know, the court system. Dare any of you having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. See, so this is the problem here in 1 Corinthians 6, right? It's not um, just taking your brother or sister to court full stop, because there may be a time to do that after the escalations. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? So what's being rebuked here in 1 Corinthians 6 is not the fact of going to court between brethren. It's going to court before going through the necessary due process that God has given to Christians. Right? He says, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world, and if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels, how much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, so he's saying, hey, if you've got things to, 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 to settle in this life, hey, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. He's saying, hey, even the least esteemed in the church will probably give you a more righteous judgment than the, than the unjust court system. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. They say, is there somebody in the church that can look at this situation and decide, hey, what should be right to be done here? But brother, go to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. So what is he talking? What is the context of this passage? Is the context of the passage to never go to court? Is there never a scenario where you should go to court? No, because, you know, what do you do in the instance where somebody is like, you know, a business deal, you've been like ripped off, like millions of dollars or whatever, you try and settle it here, you know, you may need to require government force in order to right the wrongs of people that have stolen from you, people that have done things to you, they've damaged your property. Things like that. But the idea is you go through the due process so you can decide, is this something that needs to be taken before the unbelievers, right? And this is the problem here. Why not suffer yourself to be defrauded saying, hey, you should go through these processes first, right? Rather than, can you, can you suffer, you allow this first before just going to the unbelievers, right? And there's a problem there because, you know, then he goes on to the rest of the chapter. Okay, so I don't believe this passage is saying that it is never the right thing to do because I think there are some instances where it's okay, right? But what is being rebuked here is that they're going too quickly to the court system, right? They're going to that as a first point of call rather than following the steps within the Bible, okay? So... You can attempt to settle things with them. But if they're not willing to, then you can take action. You know, does 1 Corinthians 6 mean you can't seek a resolution? No, it's just saying that there's an unjust judicial system. It's not the first point of contact. You know, and we want to make sure we compare that to Matthew 18. Now, some people might say similar things using Matthew 5. And I want to show you a couple of verses here. So Matthew 5 is another where you say, hey, when you do wrong, you turn the other cheek. Right? This is this idea in, you know, like I said, in Ned Flanders, right? People say, oh, you know, I mean, people sometimes say this even on social media. Where you, you fight back, you argue back, you might defend yourself. And they say, well, aren't you a Christian? Aren't you just meant to turn the other cheek? Well, let's, uh, let's, let's see what this is actually talking about. So Matthew 5, verse 38 says, You have heard that it had been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, 
return to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. So is this saying that you can never do right? I mean, think about this. Why would Matthew 18 exist? You know, if you can never, if resisting evil means you can never try seek a resolution, you know, never try and right the wrong, then why is Matthew 18 there? You know, why is Matthew 18 saying, well, go talk to them. Try and, you know, get people together. Escalate it to the church. You know, why does God, why does God have government? I mean, God, he says in Romans 13, you know, government is there to, to execute vengeance. It's to right the wrong, to punish the evildoers. You know, so uh, if, if you're a Christian, then therefore now you're exempt. You know, you can steal and rob and kill and government shouldn't come after you because no Christian should ever sue you at the law and never try and right the wrong if you're not willing to pay up for the damages. You know, if you hurt somebody or you steal something or you damage property, is that what it's saying? No. What is happening in Matthew 5? What's happening in Matthew 5 is the way we go about conflict resolution, the way we go about seeking restitution, even through legal means, is there's a due process. So what is being condemned here? Well, there is a due process with eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. What is that? That's not you going out and being a vigilante and getting your own justice. It's going through the due process. And in this context, it's, you know, there is a court, there's a government that is, that's where you give place unto Ra. But what were people doing? People were using these passages in Moses Right? and taking matters into their own hands. And that's why he's saying here, you know, if somebody assaults you, you don't say, oh, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, I'm going to go assault you. Right? Like some people would do. Oh, you scratched my car, no, I'm going to go pop your tyres. You know, this is like vigilantism. Right? This is you getting revenge, taking the law into your own hands. This is why he's saying, hey, you turn the other cheek. Why? Because there is a place for the law. And you can see here, even in the ver next verse, in verse 40, that it's this submission to the court system. If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. So there's a few things in this passage. One is he's saying sometimes it's worth just giving above and beyond just to avoid all the litigation and going before the unjust. That's one thing. But another thing is you can see that if, if, they, if the court system commands you to do something, that's why the court system is there. Then you're meant to submit to it, right? So you can see here that there's a court system there. Now let's talk about this eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I'll just show you one passage in Exodus 21, 22. That this is something where, like I said, that they were misapplying, that they're using these laws, right, in order to take matters into their own hands rather than following the due process. Look at this in Exodus 21, 22. If men strive, so they're fighting, two men fight, and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, so this is not an intentional killing of this baby, like abortion is. Abortion's murder. This is men fighting. How the woman got involved, we don't know. But there's an accident. She gets hurt. She's got a baby. The baby she loses the baby. Right? It's not really murder because it was an accident. And yet no mischief followed. Right? So what is that? Well, I'll tell you what I think that means in a moment. He shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him and he shall pay as the judges determine. So you can see here that if there's a fight happens, a pregnant woman loses the baby, the husband of the pregnant woman can get financial restitution from the man that he was fighting with. Right? I'm saying, hey, well, you know, my wife got, got hurt. You know, who knows? Maybe the situation is, you know, a wife comes in to try and defend her husband, and then the other man pushed her off, and then lost the baby. So we can see here that it would go through the court system, the judges would determine, hey, will lay upon him and he shall pay as the judges determine. Look, verse 23, and if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Now, what do I think this is talking about? This is a law, I believe, is discouraging people from taking the law into their own hands. Right? So what could happen? Man loses his baby in this strife, now he's going to get revenge. Goes and, I don't know, does something. Turns the house down, beats the guy up. And this is saying, look, if any mischief follows, because the right way to go about it is you go to the courts, the judges determine how to make it right. But he's saying, if any mischief follow, then you give eye for eye, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. So the punishment for taking the law into your own hands, right, 
is you now suffer whatever you inflicted on that person. Why? Because you do not have the authority. You're not in the position. You're not the government, right? You're not the court system. You don't have the authority to take matters into your own hands. So if you understand where this eye for eye, tooth for tooth came from, this is why Jesus is saying, hey, you've heard eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but I say to you that you resist not evil. Ye, you particularly, because also they're living under Roman rule here. So you don't take matters into your own hands. If somebody smites you on the right cheek, you turn to him the other also. Right? Why? Because there's a court system that you can go to, to what the Bible describes as giving place unto wrath. So look here. This is the last passage I'll go to, and then we'll stop. Romans 12. So you can see how much this aligns with Matthew 5. Right? Recompense to no man, evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. So that's something that's at the top, right? Where we talk about conflict resolution. We're trying to avoid conflict because we want to live at peace with all men. We're trying to resolve conflict to live at peace with all men. You know, you, 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 you know how you go about things. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. See, see, you don't get revenge for yourself, but rather, right? So it's not that you can't get restitution, but rather give place unto wrath for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So you might think, Victor, does that mean, you know, well, you just do the nephilim, you just, you just leave it to God. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heat coals of fire on his head. See, so you're trying to do the right thing. You're always trying to do the right thing. Be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good. So what does that mean? See, when you overcome evil with evil, that's you taking the law into your own hands. But going through due process and using the law the way it should be used, that's overcoming evil with good. You know, it doesn't mean that necessarily you can't go about getting restitution. Now the thing interesting here is, Romans 12 talks about overcoming evil with good talks about giving place unto wrath, talks about vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And then, what's the next chapter? Romans 13. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, right? There's no power but of God. And it talks about he's a minister of God, right, to execute wrath upon the evildoer. So you see there, that's, that's sometimes giving place unto wrath is you must, you must go to the court system. But like we read in 1 Corinthians 6, that shouldn't be the first point of contact. Matthew 18, try and resolve it, multiple people, escalate to the church, then you may decide what is the right thing to do. And this is where some cults get it wrong, right? Some, some religions get it wrong. They think, oh, you know, they think Matthew 18, oh, the, the church should just deal with it. So you have a pedophile, <laughs> right? Those molested kids or whatever. You say, oh, yeah, the church has dealt with it, it's forgiven, everything. No, because there are some instances where you need to engage the government and the court system in order to bring justice because as a church you can't ex you can't you know execute somebody you can't take them to jail you can't find them things like what if they're not willing to pay the fine right so there are certain instances where you might go you know what this is something we need to take to the authorities because church does not have that authority to execute these sort of judgments but the government does right so in conclusion, hopefully you learned a lot there about long-suffering, forbearing, conflict resolution, forgiveness, what forgiveness really is. So why is that distinction between long-suffering and forgiveness important, right? Because the idea that the more Christian thing to do is simply just to suffer wrong with no avenue of restitution is absolutely false, right? It's very dangerous sometimes. But on the other hand, not every situation is worth seeking restitution for. And this just requires some wisdom, right? But if somebody suffers wrong, you know, seeking restitution is not wrong, and, you know, as long as it's done in a righteous way. Okay, and that's what we talked about today. Have you learned a lot of things? All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the direction you give us in life. Thank you for many examples that we can study. And uh, Lord, we need wisdom. You know, uh, the Bible says, you know, your word says, if we lack wisdom, we ask of you. I pray, Lord, that you'll give it to us liberally, liberally and it not. 
So Lord, give us wisdom because, uh, you know, dealing with people in this world and situations, it's not black and white, and we need wisdom to uh, handle these situations. So thank you, Lord. Thank you that no, no matter what happens, we have eternal life. And um, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.